play for Jordan. And Isaiah Thomas ties him up. In his 14-year career as an NBA player, Isaiah Thomas built a reputation as tough, hard as nails, a key component of two Detroit Pistons championship teams, a basketball Hall of Famer. He would go on to spend the next phase of his life tearing down that positive reputation bit by bit. Recently, his name has come into vogue again, after that ESPN documentary that everyone and their mother wouldn't shut up about. Before that, there was a 15-year stretch where nearly every basketball-related undertaking he set out upon ended in some sort of disaster. But as infamous as his tenure with the New York Knicks still is, his systematic destruction of a 55-year-old basketball league may be even less forgivable. This is a story of greed, mismanagement, and above all, broken trust. It's 1999. The Continental Basketball Association, the sort of official minor league to the NBA, is in dire straits. The league, which once boasted of 17 teams and spanned as far west as Anchorage, Alaska, has been reduced to nine teams mostly concentrated in the upper Midwest. Over the past 20 years, teams have come and gone faster than the eye can blink. Not a season went by without at least one team moving, folding, or changing its name. Some teams were more fortunate, such as the Quad City Thunder, which lasted from 1984 until, well, the bitter end. Others weren't. Rochester, New York went through three different CBA teams in 16 years. The Oklahoma City Cavalry won the 1997 league title, and then folded. Said one former coach, you want to know a sure way to make a small fortune? Start with a big fortune and buy a CBA team. The only thing keeping the league alive was a $2 million annual payment from the NBA to retain the CBA as its official minor league, providing a training ground of sorts for players, coaches, and referees. Something needed to change quickly if the league were to survive to the 21st century. Enter Isaiah Thomas. Fresh off his stint as the first general manager and part owner of the Toronto Raptors. Like most chapters of Thomas's career after his playing days, it didn't end well for anyone. To keep a long story short, he butted heads with upper management, made a grab for majority ownership, and quit partway into his third season, leaving the team up shit creek. <laughs> So our friend Isaiah had a brainstorm and thought to himself, If I can't own an NBA team, why not a CBA team? But wait, why just one team, when I can have the whole league? In return, Isaiah promised CBA owners the entire world. He promised that under his leadership, the CBA would be more than a collection of minor league teams struggling to survive. He envisioned national sponsors, national television, exhibition games with NCAA teams, exhibition games all over the world, even webcasts, because it was 1999. It was too good to pass up. On August 3rd, 1999, Isaiah Thomas and his investors purchased the CBA for $10 million. Not just one team, the whole darn league. All of nine teams. For all intents and purposes, Isaiah Thomas was the CBA. As he put it, We are the League of Dreams. We want to be the Microsoft of basketball. But the true value of minor league sport isn't its on-field product, but the talent pool available to the major leagues. As a former NBA player and executive, Thomas had the clout to make the CBA a more reliable player development system than it already was. Of course, to do this, sacrifices had to be made. For the 1999-2000 season, Thomas cut the standard CBA player's salary from $1,500 a week to $1,100 a week. To $1,100 a week, with rookies getting $800 a week. This was supposedly done to clean out the CBA's older players, thus making the league a breeding ground for younger and, pardon the expression, hungrier players. Not all salaries in the league were cut, mind you. Quite a few people in the league office received hefty raises over their predecessors. Most of these people were Thomas's relatives and close friends. 
for instance, he hired Don Welsh, a longtime friend and former hotel executive with no past experience in sports management as league president at a salary $100,000 higher than his predecessor. Isaiah Thomas lived by the adage, you have to spend money to make money. The only problem was, they didn't have much money to spend and they weren't making any back. Said one general manager, the league office budget went from 2.1 million to 4.3 million, and the only money coming in for sure was from the NBA. Most glaringly, he spent 10% of the league's budget for the year commissioning Gallup, you know, the poll people, for a study to assess the league's management culture and help strengthen the brand. I imagine they came back with something like, your culture would be better if you didn't waste money on pointless studies. This wouldn't be such a big deal if Thomas had delivered on his promises of big-time sponsorship in national television, which he didn't. The big-time national sponsors that Thomas was banking on never came, nor would they, as few companies would be interested in attaching their brand name to a league with almost non-existent brand recognition outside of its tiny markets of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and La Crosse, Wisconsin. At this point, Thomas may have realized he was in too deep. When he first took control of the league, he made no bones about going from town to town and appealing to team sponsors that everything would be alright. When the season started, suddenly he wasn't so gung-ho about minor league basketball. He attended a lacrosse Bobcats game in November, but couldn't be coaxed out of the locker room to sign autographs after the game. He was due to appear in Quad City later that night, but cancelled his appearance because he was too tired even though there was a packed house at the arena for Isaiah Thomas night. Little did anyone know that after less than a year, he had a way out. At some point in early 2000, the NBA offered Thomas $11 million for the entire CBA. This would allow Thomas to exit with a tidy profit, avert any future disaster, and maybe focus on his career at NBC. Oh yeah, did I mention he was working at NBC during this? So naturally, Thomas declined. He had already surrounded himself with Yes Men, who had told him his league was worth more than double that amount. For better or worse, this was his league and his plan, and he was going to stick this one out no matter what. Summer 2000. Isaiah Thomas is offered the head coaching position with the defending Eastern Conference champion Indiana Pacers. Great! Good for him! Of course, this meant that he would have to do what he refused to do before, and sell his CBA interest, for reasons which should be obvious to everyone except, apparently, Isaiah Thomas. Not to worry. After all, the CBA still has some value, right? They still have something of a relationship with the NBA, so surely there has to be some investor out there that could, that could find something in that. What did David Stern want with the CBA anyway? Also that summer. David Stern announces the formation of the National Basketball Development League, set to begin play in fall of 2001. That's right, the NBA have gone and formed their own minor league. With blackjack and hookers. Even before Thomas officially closed the deal on the CBA, there were rumors that this would happen. The original plan was for the NBA to build around the existing infrastructure of the CBA, which is why the NBA had gone to Thomas originally. This was the point of no return. The one thing that had kept the CBA alive through its lean years was its status as the little brother to the NBA, and in one stroke it was gone. All the league had was a skyrocketing payroll and a bunch of teams who were hemorrhaging money themselves there was nothing of value left. No one else offered to buy the CBA, and Thomas was forced to put the league into a blind trust. In July, Isaiah Thomas officially became the Pacers' head coach, and the CBA officially became dead meat. In December 2000, Isaiah Thomas was inducted into the Hall of Fame for his services as a Detroit Piston. That same month, the league he left behind began its final season. 
there were doubts that it would even begin on time. They might as well not have bothered. Even accounting for season ticket sales, the league was deep in the red before the season tipped off, and Thomas still hadn't paid the previous team owners all that they were owed from when he purchased the league. Suddenly, that missing $2 million payment from the NBA really kinda hurt. League-wide attendance fell by an average of 8.3% from the previous season. Quad City drew less than a thousand per game, and that wasn't even a fifth of the capacity for that arena. After only a month, the league lost a million dollars. By February, teams struggled to meet payroll. The league All-Star game was cancelled, simply because there wasn't enough money left to hold one. On February 8th, the inevitable happened. Teams were informed by fax that play was suspended immediately and the teams were to be sold back to their original owners. Only five of the owners chose to take this offer. Those teams would jump to the International Basketball League to finish the season. The rest simply folded, as there was no point to running a team that had millions of dollars more debt than when they had left it behind. There are conflicting reports as to whether or not Thomas actually did advance some of his own money to pay players' wages, though at least two team executives claim he did not. I was going to try and put up some kind of half-hearted defense of Isaiah's ambitions, his business acumen, and his true motives. Then I remembered that this is the same guy who, as head coach and general manager of the Knicks, had a woman fired in retaliation for her whistleblowing about his, alleged, sexual harassment. This is not a man of the highest character. Now, it wasn't like the CBA was in the best of shape before he came along, and it would have been difficult for any one person to rescue it. Indeed, according to one team executive, three teams were on the verge of going under before Thomas's initial purchase, and there was little chance of the league surviving with only six teams. Regardless, Thomas's destruction of the league was almost impressive. Under his reign, the CBA spent far more than it could hope to make back, in the hopes of becoming something that it could never be. Thomas surrounded himself with yes-men, refused to listen to any other ideas, and when the going got tough, he walked away. One former general manager said it best, You promised us the moon, but then didn't even build the rocket. 